When the sage rules the state, he unifies rewards, unifies punishments, and unifies teaching. When rewards are unified, the army has no rivals. When punishments are unified, orders are implemented. When teaching is unified, inferiors heed superiors. Thus, clarifying rewards eliminates waste. Clarifying punishments eliminates executions. Clarifying teaching eliminates alterations. Then the people know how to commit themselves to the people's tasks, and the state has no divergent customs. Clarifying rewards is like arriving at no rewards. Clarifying punishments is like arriving at no punishments. Clarifying teaching is like arriving at no teaching. What is called unifying rewards means that benefits, emoluments, official position, and rank uniformly derive from military attainments, and that there are no other ways to dispense them. Therefore, the knowledgeable and the ignorant, the noble and the base, the courageous and the cowardly, the worthy and unworthy, all fully utilize their innermost wisdom and fully exhaust the power of their limbs, going forth to die in the service of their superiors. The bravos and the worthies from all under heaven will follow him, the ruler, just as water flows downwards. Hence, his troops will have no rivals, and his orders will be implemented throughout all under heaven. Ten thousand chariot states will not dare to repel his soldiers on the battlefield. One thousand chariot states will not dare to protect their walled cities. If a ten thousand chariot state will try to repel his soldiers on the battlefield, then in the battle he will overturn their army. If a one thousand chariot state will protect its walled cities, then in an assault he will raise its walls. If in a battle he surely overtains the rival's army, and in an assault he surely raises the rival's walls, then he will possess all the walled cities and subdue all the regional lords, summoning them to his state. Then, even if he were to bestow lavish grants and rewards, will there ever be any wasteful expenses? In the past, Tang was enfiefed at Zan Mao, King Wen was enfiefed at Qizhou, and their land was 100 li squared. Tang fought Jie at the fields of Mingqiao, King Wu fought Zhou amid Mu fields. They defeated the nine armies of their enemies. At the end, they apportioned the lands and enfiefed the regional lords, and the soldiers who participated in the fight were granted registered hamlets. War chariots were put to rest and not mounted. Horses were released to the south of Mount Hua, and oxen were released at the Hongnong marshes. They were released until their old age and not reassembled for war. Such were the rewards of Tang and Wu. Hence it is said, should the grain of Zan Mao and Qizhou be used to reward all the people under heaven, everybody would receive just one sheng. Should the money of Zan Mao and Qizhou be used to reward the people under heaven, everybody would receive just one coin. Hence it is said, the rulers of 100 li squared were able to enfeef their ministers because they increased the original territory. How were they able to grant registered hamlets to the soldiers who participated in the fight and to increase the rewards so that generosity extended to horses and oxen? It is because they excelled at utilizing the resources of all under heaven to reward the people of all under heaven. Hence, it is said, clarifying rewards eliminates waste. When Tang and Wu exterminated Jie and Zhou, no evildoers remained within the seas. All under heaven was greatly stabilized. They built the five granaries, stored the five sorts of arms, put military affairs to rest, and implemented civilian teaching. They carried shields and halberds reversed, official tables were stored in girdles, and they created music to manifest their virtue. At that time, Rewards and emoluments were not implemented, but the people were self-ordered. Hence, it is said, clarifying rewards is like arriving at no rewards. What is called unifying punishments means imposing punishment without regard for one's status. From chief ministers, chancellors, and generals down to nobles and commoners, whoever disobeys the king's orders, violates the state's prohibitions, or wreaks havoc on the regulations of one superior, 
should be executed without pardon. If he had merits before, but failed thereafter, this should not reduce the punishment. When one was good previously, but transgressed thereafter, this should not diminish the law. When loyal ministers and filial sons transgress, their cases should be decided according to the rules. When an official whose task is to safeguard the law does not implement the royal law, he should be executed without pardon, and the punishment should extend to the three degrees of his family members. When his colleagues know of his crime and denounce it to the superiors, they avoid punishment, and, whether noble or base, they inherit their superior's office, rank, fields, and emoluments. Hence, it is said, when punishments are heavy and criminals are mutually responsible, the people dare not try to break the law. When the people dare not try, there are no punishments. Hence, the prohibitions of the former kings, such as carrying out executions, cutting off feet, or branding the face, were imposed not because they sought to harm the people, but only to prohibit depravity and to stop transgressions. Hence, to prohibit depravity and to stop transgressions, nothing is better than to make punishments heavy. When punishments are heavy and criminals are inevitably captured, then the people dare not try to break the law. Hence, there are no penalized people in the state. When there are no penalized people in the state, it is said clear punishments eliminate executions. Lord Wen of Jin wanted to clarify punishments so as to become closer to the hundred clans. He thereupon gathered the nobles of the regional lords at the Shichen Palace. Dian Jie was the last to arrive, and the officer asked how to deal with his crime. The lord answered, execute him. The officer then broke Dian Jie's spine as an example to the army. The Jin soldiers were terrified. They discussed the matter, saying Dian Jie was the Lord's favourite, but his spine was broken to set an example. So what would happen to ourselves? Lord Wen then raised an army to invade Cao and Wulu, and to overrun the walls of Zhen. He caused Wei to deploy its field divisions eastwards, and overcame the Jing army at Chengpu. The soldiers of the three armies stopped firmly as if their feet were cut off, and moved rapidly like flowing water. The soldiers of the three armies dared not violate the prohibitions. Hence, Lord Wen merely borrowed the way of light and heavy from Dian Jie's spine, and the state of Jin became well ordered. In the past, Dan, the Duke of Zhou, killed Guan Shu and expelled Huo Shu, saying they violated prohibitions. The multitudes under heaven all said, he did not depart from appropriate punishments in dealing with his younger brothers, so how much less will he for strangers? Hence, all under heaven know that when the knife and the saw are employed at court, all within the seas will be properly ruled. Therefore it is said, clarifying punishments is like arriving at no punishments. What is called the unification of teaching is that none of these, the broadly educated, the argumentative, the knowledgeable, the trustworthy, the honest, those skilled at ritual and music, those who cultivate their conduct, and those who establish cliques, or those who are appointed due to their reputation or after having requested an audience, will be allowed to become rich and noble, to criticize punishments, or to establish their private opinions independently and submit them to superiors. The solid will be broken, the sharp will be blunted. Even if one is knowledgeable, crafty, and glib-tongued, generous or simple, he should not be able to seek benefits from superiors unless he has merit. Thus, the gates of riches and nobility are exclusively in the field of war. He who is able to distinguish himself at war will pass through the gates of riches and nobility. He who is stubborn and tenacious will meet with constant punishment and will not be pardoned. Therefore, fathers and elder brothers, minor brothers, acquaintances, relatives by marriage, and colleagues, all say, what we should be devoted to is only war, and that is all. Hence, the able-bodied are devoted to war, the elderly and infirm are devoted to defence, the dead have nothing to regret, the living are ever more devoted and encouraged. This is what I, your minister, call the unification of teaching. 
People's desire for riches and nobility stops only when the coffin is sealed. And entering the gates of riches and nobility must be through military service. Therefore, when they hear about war, the people congratulate each other. And whenever they move or rest, drink or eat, they sing and chant only about war. This is why I, your minister, say clarifying teaching is like arriving at no teaching. These are what I, your minister, call the three teachings. The sage cannot comprehensively understand the essentials of all the myriad things. Hence, in ordering the state, he focuses on the essential to deal with the myriad things. Thus, his teachings are few, but attainments are many. The sage's way of ordering the state is easy to understand, but difficult to implement. Thus, the stage does not necessarily add anything to the existing norms, and the ordinary ruler does not necessarily cast the existing norms away. When they kill the people, it is not considered evil. When they reward them, it is not considered benevolent. It is because the law of the state is clear. The sage grants offices and bestows ranks according to merit. Hence, the worthy do not worry. The sage is not lenient towards transgressions, nor does he pardon crimes. Hence, depravity does not arise. The sage, in ordering the state, investigates the one, and that is all.